what is nothing? Hello and welcome back to the third video in our Zero by One publishing video series. Today we have absolutely nothing to offer. <laughs> well, what I mean is what we're going to discuss is nothing. Mm, that still doesn't work. Let's just say that after you watch this video, nothing will make sense. Which doesn't mean that everything won't make sense, or that it will. I don't know. This is what's known as the paradox of nothing. Nothing is difficult to communicate, and this doesn't mean that everything is easy to communicate. It means, well, just forget it. Let's just stick with the question. The question is, what is nothing? So let's break apart this question. What is known as the interrogative? It's the part that's asking the question. It's trying to find information. Is is the third person singular of the present tense of be. And be means that you exist. This is, pertains to one's status and existence. And nothing is the direct object. This is the focus of our inquisition. The antiparticle of this question is, what isn't everything? The two go hand in hand. So if we ask the question, what is order? We can answer with, whatever is not chaos. And if we ask, what isn't chaos? We could answer with, whatever is order. If we ask, what is alive? We can answer with, whatever is not dead. And if we ask, what isn't dead? We can answer with, whatever is alive. If we ask what is right, obviously we can answer with whatever is not wrong. And if we ask what is not wrong, we can equally answer with whatever is right. So if the answer to the question, what isn't everything, is whatever is nothing, then the most logical answer to what is nothing is whatever is in everything. But we can't seem to reconcile this within our minds. On the surface, this appears to make sense, but after further review, it becomes problematic. Something can be ordered and something can be chaotic. Likewise, something can be alive and something can be dead. Something can be right, something can be wrong. But the truth is that something can be anything, but something cannot be nothing. Nothing doesn't belong to the realm of to be, which violates our question. So when we speak of nothing in a universal sense, we're actually talking about non-existence. Like nothing, non-existence is defined as the absence of everything. With nothing not being included in the set of everything, then nothing is non-existent. That doesn't mean that since nothing is non-existent that we can only be something, or does it? The debate over whether non-existence and nothing can be accurately communicated, let alone be deemed conceivable, has raged since the 5th century BC. The problem faced is that you can't have nothing because there wouldn't be anything available for you to have. You also cannot do nothing because there must be something for you to do in order for you to do it. Doing nothing is not doing anything. So the consensus is that non-existence, aka nothing, is inconceivable, which makes sense because you must have something that is conceivable in order for it to exist. Non-existence is not a something, so non-existence cannot be conceived. Now I know there's going to be pushback in the comments section, but allow me to explain. I'm going to go one step further and say that a state of total existence cannot exist either. How could this state be described? It would be a scenario where every Planck unit of emptiness has been filled with something, and there's no empty space between anything and everything. We don't have that now. We got plenty of space in between things. So if this were the case, then you wouldn't comprehend it because there is no other reference point available for comprehension of the state that you are in. What would you use to define your state of total existence if no antiparticle called non-existence was available? An analogy would be as if everything was blue, you would not realize that any color existed at all. To isolate a color, you need a minimum of one other color to offer conceivability for both. In a world where half of everything is yellow and the other half is blue, suddenly names can be attached to the two phenomena, and a conceivable difference is comprehensible. When we consider existence and non-existence in the same way, we end up with the ultimate existential paradox. With existence dependent on non-existence for conceivability and vice versa, the furthest back one can regress while still adhering to logic is the juxtaposition of existence and non-existence. But this also begs the question, if there has always been existence and non-existence, then what represented the existence side of this juxtaposition prior to Big Bang? That's where logic chimes in. Existence demonstrates a consistent pattern of evolution from simplicity to complexity. We know that the universe started off as a trillion degree quark gluon plasma soup and evolved into eight billion complex humans who possess brains that science has declared the most complex structure in the known universe. Science also claims that the 93 billion light years wide universe we observe today started off as an immeasurably small point of singularity. We know that elements listed on our periodic table evolved from hydrogen, which is only one proton and a single electron, to agnesium over the lifespan of the universe. 
Life started out as a single-celled organism and evolved into a plethora of complex life forms, including the life forms currently watching this video. So if we can observe this pattern from simplicity to complexity permeating throughout all manner of existence, then we should also be able to rewind these patterns and deduce how existence was present within this existence-non-existence -existence juxtaposition. If the ongoing pattern is simplicity to complexity, then logic states that we need to establish what would serve as the most minimalistic representation of existence. One might think a quark would be the best candidate, but we can see things that are smaller. We can see the smallest characteristic of the universe, which we establish as the Planck unit. Science argues that any type of existence beyond the Planck length is inconsequential, or beyond measurability and scientific observation. But we could still conceive something that's half of a Planck unit, so science hasn't really reached the lowest threshold of existence, they just left the game with the establishment of the Planck unit. Now, logic states that whatever I toss out as the smallest representation of existence could be negated by the conception of something half the size of whatever I offer. So whatever represents the smallest element of existence would not be made of any substance, nor have any characteristics that can be reduced any further. Mathematics offers us its candidate for the smallest framework for existence in the form of a mathematical point, which was explained in a previous video, which you can see up in the top right hand corner. A mathematical point has no size, shape, length, or any dimensional properties and is only known by its coordinates. If you draw an XYZ axis in three dimensional space, wherever those three axis lines converge establishes the existence of a mathematical point. So let's juxtapose two perceptually nothing arenas. The area to the left of your screen we'll call non-existence. Here there are no colors, lights, structures, laws, fields, nor even the possibility for the existence of such things. The area on the right we'll call existence. As you can see, the existence side looks identical to the non-existence side, but it secretly contains a minimalistic representation of existence called a mathematical point. The way we can establish the existence of this point is through its coordinates. In this scenario, we're using two-dimensional planes as our framework, so an x-y axis will suffice for identifying its location. The point located at the center of those axis lines represents existence, and everything beyond the convergence represents non-existence. However, the lines used to represent the x-y axis coordinates are also made of mathematical points, so we're technically using points to demonstrate the existence of points, which borderlines on circular reasoning. So let's remove the axis and see what we get. Once again, there's no observable difference between the two arenas, but we've already demonstrated that a single mathematical point is present on the existence side, so now we're kind of stuck in a paradox. Is the mathematical point still present on the right side or not? How do we know for sure with both sides appearing identical? And how did a mathematical point find its way into this void in the first place? To answer these questions, we need to understand the hierarchy of structure. Points are the building blocks of virtual structure. Structure starts with a single mathematical point, a string of points moving perpendicular from their origin forms a one-dimensional line. If all of the points on this line move perpendicular from the line, we end up with a two-dimensional plane. In this example, we've constructed a rectangle. Moving specific points perpendicular from their origin points can create a variety of two-dimensional shapes. And should we move all of the points perpendicular from the rectangle's surface, we end up with a three-dimensional cube. Logic tells us that if we rewind geometry, just like we did with the universe, then we should end up at a geometric point of singularity. And that's exactly what we have right here. All of the points that make up this cube are now compressed within this one basic point. So does a single mathematical point officially represent our most rudimentary state of existence? Absolutely not. The truth is that there is a lesser state of existence beyond that which can be demonstrated by a mathematical point. Like a point, this fundamental representation of existence has no size, shape, mass, or anything else, yet it could still paradoxically exist. However, the location of this strange fundamental state is unknown. Its function remains unspecified, and it cannot be isolated through any axis lines or coordinates. So what do we call this most fundamental state of existence? Well, the word mathematics is defined as the science of structure, order, and relation that has evolved from the elemental practices of counting, measuring, and describing the shapes of objects. If we take away all of the symbols, numbers, exponents, and calculations contained within the set called mathematics, all that would remain is the container, which is mathematics. But we wouldn't know what mathematics is or how it functions. In fact, the set called mathematics would remain incomprehensible until we perform our very first mathematical operation. This is when everything mathematics represents suddenly becomes actualized. Let's move one rung lower on our existential ladder. The word language is defined as the principal method of human communication, consisting of words used in structured and conventional way and conveyed by speech, writing, or gesture. 
Mathematics is considered a language, so it would likewise be included in our language set. If we take away the letters, words, paragraphs, and gestures contained within the set called language, all that would remain is its set container, which is language. But just like the mathematics set, we wouldn't know what language is or how it functions. In fact, the set called language would remain incomprehensible until we perform our very first act of communication. This is when everything that language represents is actualized. Descending one more rung on our existential ladder, we encounter the existence set. The word existence is defined as the fact or state of living, being, or having objective reality. Notice that the language and mathematics sets are included within the existence set. Well, that's because they both exist. But if we take away all of the objects, life, fields, structures, and constructs contained within the set called existence, all that would remain is the set container, which is existence. However, we wouldn't comprehend what existence is or how it functions without something to go by. In fact, the set called existence would remain incomprehensible until we perform our very first existential function. This is when everything that existence represents becomes actualized. Now, if we stick to this reductionist style template, then the best way to describe the most fundamental state of existence is to simply use the set container called existence without any of its set numbers. But how do we establish that this most minimalistic representation of existence actually exists when there's no way to isolate it, observe it, or even identify its location by way of its coordinates? We need to establish that existence is present on the existence side while still adhering to logic. So what would be the most logical way to pull this off? The answer is embarrassingly simple. We count it. We can demonstrate a minimalistic representation of existence that's able to separate itself from what we perceive as non-existence by assessing the amount of existence that we have available. Since we are able to count this as one, then this establishes the presence of existence without needing any coordinates or axis lines. Existence one, two. And that which is was without knowledge and understanding, and that which is not was upon the face of the abyss. And the logic embedded within that which is counted the number of that which is, and the number of that which is was one. If we attempt the same with the non-existent side, we run into a problem. There is no existence present, so the total number of existence we have available is zero. Existence one, three. And that which is said, let that which is not be counted as zero, and there was knowledge of zero. The act of self-enumeration by existence is what establishes the presence of existence and the non-existence of whatever cannot be counted. The moment this basic logical assessment took place, the timeless juxtaposition of existence and non-existence was broken. Existence was actuated, and the unstoppable movement from simplicity to complexity began. Non-dimensional mathematics and virtual structure evolved into the multidimensional substance which kept pushing forward into life and ultimately into the emergence of 8 billion self-aware humans. Everything that exists can be traced back to a timeless juxtaposition just prior to Big Bang. The simplest form of self-enumeration was all that was required to start a universal chain reaction that's still taking place 13.8 billion years later. So the question, what is nothing, has turned out to be a non sequitur, because nothing cannot be anything, and only nothing can come from nothing. Since a single isolated state of existence or non-existence would be inconceivable, the juxtaposition of existence and non-existence is as far back as one can regress while still adhering to logic. A mathematical point is the second least representative element of existence, and its existence can be empirically established through the implementation of coordinates. Self-existence is the least possible representation of existence and can be empirically established through self-enumeration, which yields a counting of one. Non-existence has no coordinates, nor can it be counted. There's nothing there. Therefore, non-existence is inconceivable and thus counted as zero. To discover how this evolution takes place and why there are so many theories surrounding existence, order the book titled Zero by One from one of the links provided in the video description. This extremely controversial book chronicles the evolution of existence from its humble beginnings all the way up to modern times. The next video in this series is The Five Laws of Existence, where we break down the rules for what can and cannot exist. Note that Zero by One Publishing will never ask you to like our videos or subscribe to this channel. That's completely up to you. So stay tuned for the next video.